hello and welcome back to this very special episode of no books on a dead planet the podcast where we read climate books so you don't have to today is a very special episode because it's actually the first ever recorded live episode of the podcast that I've ever done. It was so exciting. Uh, We were really, really kindly invited to record at Dartmouth House, darling, uh, by the English Speaking Union, Dartmouth House. I have to say it like that. If you Google it, you'll see why I have to say Dartmouth House. Um, It genuinely, the uh, room that we recorded in genuinely looked like the ballroom scene from The Sound of Music. It was really, really beautiful. Lots of you came along. So thank you, everybody who came to listen to the podcast being recorded live. So exciting. Um, Our guest, was Monique Ruffy, who is an incredible writer. She wrote The Mermaid of Black Conch. You might have heard of her from that, which won the Costa Fiction Award in 2020. She's a Trinidadian and British writer. She's written seven books and co-founded The Writers Rebel, which is um, an active campaigning group inside of Extinction Rebellion, which is really, really exciting to have her on board to chat about a book, which I also really, really enjoyed. We're going to be chatting about The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable, which is by Amazon have gauche he speaks about the role of story and narrative when we speak about the climate crisis and as somebody who is a writer as well in the kind of ecosystem of creatives that gather around the crisis whether we can really make a difference with what we say and why it feels so unthinkable to explain or even write about i'll leave you now to listen to that live recording Um, the kind of tentative tagline for this podcast is we read climate books so you don't have to so you're very you've done the accurate you've done the correct thing and not read the book because that's that's what we're here to discuss Monique thank you so much for joining us tonight I'm really really excited to have you uh, I'm a big fan of the mermaid and rat conch so um, I was just like when you when you agreed to do it I was like yes um, we've got lots of books out the back as well so at the end we can all have a little collective Ooh. bookshop together it'll be really really fun um, but when I asked you to come on the podcast um, I suggested a few different books that you might want to talk about and you I said any books that you want to talk about let me know and you picked this book I would love to hear a little bit about what brought you to this book oh gosh um so my dear friend and colleague Liz Jensen who is a member of Writers Rebel and also a climate fiction writer it's one of her favorite books and she when we when we formed Writers Rebel four or five years ago and we were tweeting and we were like all over social media. I mean, she was like shouting about this book and calling out to Amitav Ghosh himself and, um, and talking about how, you know, writers are asleep and, you know, where there's this big derangement, you know, we can't write climate fiction books for all sorts of reasons. They're seen as sort of sci-fi or they're seen as fantasy books or they can't be taken seriously by literary writers. So it's the kind of book that came to me via... Um, you know, a writer who I, I respect and who's engaged with the climate movement. And, and then more and more people would, be, would name check this book. And so I only read it about a year ago um, in Trinidad, actually. And um, because we're now, I, I teach also at Manchester Met at the writing school there and we're running a, a course on green writing. And so I just wanted to read the book to see if it was one of the books we want to put on the course. And of course it is, because it's a great book. It's, it's, a, it's an amazingly uh, philosophical, you know, deep, if I can use that word. But it's a, it's a cracking book about writing and the climate emergency and capitalism and, you know, everything that caused the climate crisis and forests that are watching us. It's just, it's a great book. And it's quite short as well. I love that as well. I love that you've packed it all in. And I think as well, like, I'm really looking... I read this a few months ago, so when you suggested Mm -hmm. it, I was like, yes, I've already read it. And it was because I really wanted to read books about the climate from people whose profession was writing. (laughs) Because I love a good scientist who writes a book, but sometimes it's the idea of telling a story and being able to draw somebody in and really explain in a more um, kind of... uh, just more interesting way sometimes um what the real issues are so i loved it too and i thought it was incredible it's a good it's a good book um you strike me as somebody who's very good about talking about the climate because you you co-founded writers rebel Mm -hmm. um you talk a lot about it in your professional life as well and obviously you're running the the manchester met course Mm. has it always been that way because i have found climate conversations really awkward in the past and i still find them a little awkward which is why this is slightly masochistic of me but have you always always found it i guess 
um, is it easy to talk about it? Yeah, do you generally? find it, do you find it, um, or has it been a struggle? Well, I mean, there's some, there's so what's happened is, it's like a slow drop. It's because climate, the climate crisis um, has been affecting us for over a hundred years, but we're only seeing the drama of it now. So it was hard to not just talk about the climate crisis, but to write about it as well, mm. because where was the drama? You're like preaching that to the converted it's like no one's it's not that people there's all kinds of mixed problems with it in the old days people used to find it quite boring okay it's like yeah. who cares mm. and these days people feel just guilty and shut down about it and then there's the do doom scrolling you know everybody's overwhelmed by it as well so we switch off and then we think that one of us can't change this that's completely untrue um, but that is something that I think I come across a lot, you know, what can I do? And I don't want to get myself arrested, and all these things. But there has been, sorry, you have got me on subject, I've been on. <laughs> no, I love it, keep going. There, there has been data. You're here to talk, don't apologise for I talking. I think the Office of National Statistics has found that like a high percentage, like 70 to 80% of the population is concerned. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. only less than 1% or less than 3% is uh, marching and um, active in, in an environmental group um, or a member of Greenpeace or paying, you know, putting money towards Greenpeace or Extinction Rebellion. But 70, 70 or 80% people are concerned. So how do we wake people up? Mm. How do we make these conversations not so um, intimidating or you know, to shut us down immediately because we're also um, basically overwhelmed and feeling pretty guilty. So we need to find, we do need to find really articulate, compassionate ways in for anybody to like climb on board and go, I am in that 70%, I am concerned, what do I do? Beyond just the obvious, which is recycling. You know, obviously there's a bit more you could do. The recycling thing always worries me because I've heard about how if your whole streets recycling is contaminated then yours doesn't go in the bin so i'm sitting there at my sink like scrubbing my kit my tins and getting cut on them and stuff and being like i bet number 82 isn't washing hers <laughs> i'm like looking across like you better be washing yours brenda because i'm washing mine but yeah it does feel like countries in in mm. europe you know they're, they're miles ahead on this yeah and the, and this whole thing with recycling it, they make it so easy for everybody there are bins and depots and you know, at home, everything's stuck. You know, you get fined if you don't recycle. You know, so they're, they're way ahead of us. They're like 20 years ahead of us, yeah. which is where we're going. You know, those big depots that you might see in mm. North European countries, they're coming. Yeah. So a point that he makes in the book that I thought was really interesting that, he's, that he, he talked, and I think we talked about this before, about how in other parts of history where something really huge and threatening and scary has happened, mm. writers have swelled up and started writing poetry about it immediately, releasing plays, opening things. And he doesn't feel like that has really happened when it's come to the climate. I think that's changed recently. We were, yeah, this is this was published about five years ago, and I'm thinking actually. I have a little list. Oh, <laughs> I bought my list because I was thinking that's not true. And actually, in he's just so writers rebel have a blog, we have a newsletter. Please find us, writersrebel.com. But we just interviewed Amitav, and um, he feels that since he's written oh, this book, yeah. it's changed. And so we're looking at books that have been, gone viral. The Ministry of the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson mm. and The Overstory by Richard Powers and Jenny Offal's Weather and The Red People by Maggie G. I mean, there's a massive list of writers and poets. <clears throat> there's this new prize called the Ginkgo Prize. Mm. And there's you. There's uh, tons of writers are now active. There's Liv Talk and Chris Redmond and Hot Poets and Poets of the Planet. And <clears throat> so activism and writing has just mushroomed, it's exploded yeah. in the last three or four years. And it's such a big tackle, like a topic to tackle. And I think that it sometimes can be quite intimidating. So I think it's great that people are. And I think like, say with the overstory, he, t he decided to tackle it with seven different stories. <laughs> and that's how I sometimes feel it's possible to do it. It's just like, you really have to go in there and, and circle the thing. You can't yeah. just write about it like it's one historical event or one cause. Well, I mean, Gosh talks about it as a poly crisis, doesn't he? Mm. He says, you know, climate change isn't just about um, it's getting hotter and there's more extreme weather. It's biodiversity loss, grand scale, you know, extinction of everything from like in insects to mammals 
and then it's oceans and it's the air, it's pollution, you know, it's carbon, it's everything. So it's a big thing for us all to get our head round, but it's not going to go away. In fact, you know, every summer I've just been in a meeting with um, Just Stop Oil and, you know, how does a mainstream publisher um, get into bed with, you know, a small radical group? And we're like, well, you don't need to worry about um, PR because the weather's doing it for us. Or it's the weather's our PR. Mm. Every summer, yeah. it gets worse. And yeah, it's and, a um, denser marketing and so campaign. That, to be that's, like, that's that's the campaign, you know. Yeah, it's scary. <laughs> well, it's, I'm also yeah. watching. There's this um, book called Deep Adaptation by. I think I think what people seem to think is is just don't think about it mm. um, because they think the worst is going to happen. Like the the planet's going to like. Um, blow up or dry up like that's what's going to happen and it's not <laughs> that's not what's going to happen what's going to happen is um, a period of adaptation where things are going to change irrevocably and never change back and we will adapt and that's going to be what's going to happen in the foreseeable future the next 20 30 40 years we're going to adapt and we're seeing it already for example just one small example is Within a year or two, not one of you in this room would think of going on holiday in August. You just won't book a holiday in August. You're not going to go to Greece, you're not going to go to Portugal, you're probably not going to go to Thailand, you're not going to go anywhere in August because that's a bad time to go, it's going to get impossible. And this summer we saw, I mean I don't know about you, but in Greece it was like the fire in roads and it's like suddenly free Greek holidays, free Greek, fly to Greece, fly to Greece. It's like good luck, mate. Who's mm-hmm. gonna get? Who's gonna get on that on that um, twenty-five quid flight? You know. So that's what I mean by ad- adapting. We're gonna adapt before we know we've adapted. Totally, and I think it's it's also gonna be interesting to emotionally prepare people for that. And I think that's how we use stories. I think I, we mentioned before Rebecca Solnit who wrote. Uh, hope in the dark kind of going back and recording all the times when people have actually responded really well to crises like this and we often remember the awful parts because they're the parts that get films made about them or they they seem more salacious or more sublime so we write about the horrible responses people have had to, to crisis and not so much about the good stuff on your reread we were talking a lot about all the different things that came up for you but i'd love to hear what you thought about the forest section because i thought it was oh, really yeah. interesting so he talks about i'm just gonna the uncanny mm. um but in the environmental uncanny, not supernatural uncanny. And he's talking about how is it that, for example, a collective entity like a forest, which is a large swath of trees, of nature, how have they inserted themselves into our unconscious, into our collective unconscious? Like into every single fairy tale we know, there is a forest, you know, and the prince or the hero has to hack their way into the forest, through the forest, and the forest is this kind of big unknown, and how is it that it's a pan-global la 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 entity? How is it, how is it, um, how do we, you know, what happened? And this idea that, in fact, nature is thinking us. Their PR team is... uh... I know. (laughs) And then he's also saying, you know, could it be that climate change is a massive intervention by Earth, by the Earth? It's like, um, and it's a kind of, um, answer back to our dualistic, capitalistic, all the things that we've put in place that basically puts us as, you know, imper- imperial superiors, um, that we are superior to nature and that we're better than nature, we're better than everything, we're more important than everything. And, it, you know, that's one of his, one of his interesting ideas. Yeah, and the, the kind of idea he talks as well about how little Western literature talks about the non-human. Yeah, yeah <laughs> And it yeah. made me think a little bit about your mermaid. Well, mermaid yeah, yeah, because she is kind of of both worlds mm. a little bit, and it's that kind of like that othering and how It's nature... easy to other... And I read... I was listening to someone say that the ultimate other are aliens. Mm. You know, we have so drastically ridiculed and kind of uh, horrified... Um, anything that possibly might be a civilization beyond this planet, I mean, it's just fair game 
Yeah, it just kind of seems ridiculous just, that people would be living out there yeah, because yeah, we, the, we're, no one else the, but us. we're the centre. Yeah. Yeah. I think as well, I read a little bit in um, Feral by George Monbiot about this fear of forests and how we've all been taught to be scared of forests because it's the it's the kind of separation between the civilised and the uncivilised in the forest. Yeah. And it's one of the big things that people cite as a problem when we're trying to rewild wolves into the UK because it's part of our fairy tales is that we can't go to the forest, there's yeah. wolves there, wolves are scary. Red Riding Hood, yeah. And there's actually a big problem in the UK that we don't have wolves anymore. So they're trying to almost like unpick those fairy tales for people and be like, wolves aren't bad, they won't hurt you, we kind of need them. So it's that... I, I, yeah, so I think, you know, and also, have you read any Richard Maybe? I haven't, no. Okay, so he wrote a book called The Nature Cure and he used to own, um, with, he used to live with his mum, I think, and he used to own a forest... Mm-hmm. Um, a plot of land with, with some do. old forest on it and um, you know he wrote Encyclopedia Britannica that's yeah. what he did that yeah. and so um, he got depressed basically and he cured himself through the forest that's how they, they tried to medicate him they put him on this that and the other all these drugs and he went to nature and, um, and he talks about how in the natural world um, animals cure themselves as well and he talks about hedgehogs hibernating and um, owl things that just like close up and close their eyes and go to sleep and um, how nature cures themselves and that yeah. forests are these entities that are in such amazing bioharmony mm-hmm. you know they're not going to hurt anyone mm. yeah totally but and we're terrified know. we're terrified of them we also it's kind of the arrogance of terror as well isn't it is that they're kind of like oh well we can understand enough about this to be scared of it it couldn't possibly be thinking for itself or have its own governing and I mean, do you know, have you been look, reading about mushrooms and trees? I have read a little about the mushrooms, mushrooms and Mer- trees. Merlin, his name is Merlin follow, the Mushroom Man. Um, Fantastic <laughs> Fungi, has anyone seen that on Netflix? Yeah, I mean, whoa, I mean, mycelium. <laughs> I mean, fungi, I mean, they're, they're there's, more of them than us. Us. <laughs> there's more of them than us. And also um, tree networks. I mean, trees are all kind of like chatting to each other. Mm. You know, they're all connected. And then, you know, how dare we? We're just so, we're just so arrogant. Mm. You know. Do you think that literature will change in the future because of that? I mean, maybe you get a bit of an insight into that from teaching as well, like talking to the students about how they feel about literature. Do you, do you think it will change to be more collective? Or <coughs> well, we, think what, it, you mean, apart from AI being well, yeah, apart from doing it for us, um, I <laughs> if really we still love, get to write books, I really love working with young people and people who are emerging as writers. And it's yeah, every time I start a new term. I'm like, what is everyone going to put on the table? And people, <coughs> just when you think you can't reinvent the novel, someone writes some amazing kind of graphic thing or, you know, someone writes something you've never read before, you've never seen before. So I, I think the novel is in really good shape. Yeah. No one, people aren't going to stop telling stories and writing fiction or, or poetry. Good. We might we might definitely need it. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your tabs because I brought lots of tabs. Oh my up, god! But you've brought even more. I'm really really impressed. So I asked us both to pull out some parts of the book that we found particularly interesting. But I'm eyeing all of your beautiful coloured oh, tabs, and I know that yours are going to be cooler than mine. So I don't know. I'll just pretend that I picked the same ones as you. <laughs> I've got so many. I mean, shall I just read out lines from the book? Yeah, do it because there's so many. I was okay. really going through the highlights. There's so many quotable parts that were interesting. Okay, I like what he was saying early on about landscape being dynamic. Mm. and he talks about the river shifting and again you know the British landscape seems to be very settled and static we don't have a lot of earthquakes since Facebook was invented and anyone to the north and the south families in the north and the south can be connected in the Caribbean we have a lot of quakes and tremors and so um, the minute there's an earthquake you know about it through Facebook but there are parts of Trinidad, well, we have a pitch lake, we have oil oozing from the ground. And then there are parts of the centre of Trinidad where you think, well, hang on a minute, and you look, you're driving around, and literally the land's a bit like that. And it's because it's, it is soft. You know, it's not, yeah. it's not hard land. And, and so he talks about this dynamism, that, that our surroundings are not static, they're not just like, you know... Um, and we, we're seeing it now with shrinkage of water and we're now seeing what, what was underneath. Yeah. You know, we're seeing things being revealed and, and I've, I've literally seen with my own eyes a uh, river change its course overnight due to flooding. Really? Yeah, in and Trinidad. It's, it's that thing of, yeah, like we're very used to the way our landscape looks. We just think everything... And I think there's a part as well him talking about how we just, we treat nature a lot like a backdrop. Like... Something dramatic or beautiful will happen to humans, and then in the background, yeah, nature will be chilling. It will just be, yeah, it's, it's a nice little backdrop for life, and it's not. 
I think in the future we're going to have to think about it more as a, a character. <laughs> I think, well, what's fascinating, I mean, don't get me started about London. London's fascinating because obviously it's, um, if, we, if we were to dig a hole, right, like, get a sort of drill going right down, there would be thousands of year old peat down there because London's all on a bog, it's all wet, isn't it? They have to drain London. It's wet flats, it's rivers everywhere, a lot of the rivers have been culverted, and then we would encounter things like Roman amphitheatres and a, a Saxon boat down there somewhere and mm. all kinds of stuff. So even though we don't think, we think, we look around and we think, well, this house has been here a while, but it hasn't been here for thousands of years. It's been here for hundreds of years. So before this house, there was something else. And the whole of London is like rivers and wells, don't get me started on sacred wells and things like that. Yeah. But so in so, I think London, the UK seems to have settled Yeah. in a way that... When you Trinidad come from other been, yeah. places, um, the landscape is much more fluid. Like, you know, sometimes you'll wake up and like that, something's not there. Or, or things grow so fast that you see something change in days. Yeah. And it becomes a completely different place. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I, I guess it also made me think a little bit, like this, the stuff in the book about how old the world is and, and you saying about how things will change and things aren't remembered, is that I think for some people, I've heard people talk about how they want to write a book so that they will live on after they die. And that, that being being an author is part of like living on. But but when, when we talk about the climate crisis, something scary is like, I don't know how long the books will live. Maybe uh, they'll be eaten by... I think mushrooms. about that all the time. <laughs> um, so I it's think, the idea I of like, think, what, you know, why do we write if it's not to be remembered? And maybe it is just to talk to the current people that are around and to enjoy the landscape that we have and the, the people around us, rather than wanting to make things permanent, which I think is a way we think about literature a lot. I think we might have another hundred years. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. whether we've got another thousand years, I really don't think that's the case. Okay. I don't think we're going to we'll be... See. I think we've got a hundred years... Okay, challenge accepted. I hate to say that, but I don't I think there's going to be another... <laughs> Maybe another, 200? Huh? 200? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, I don't we'll think see. We've got, I don't think the world is about to blow up tomorrow, but I think if you've got a five-year-old child at the moment, mm. you know, by the time that child is 35, things will be very different. The world will be really different, yeah. yeah. Um, I was really interested in your thoughts on this part about culpability and authors, because I imagine that's something you talk about a lot, but it's hard to talk with other writers about to say, oh, actually, you might be um, uh, kind of culpable. So he, he says, uh, is it possible that the arts and literature of this time will only one day be remembered, not for their daring, not for their championing of freedom, but rather their complicity in the great derangement? And, and is... is I think uh, that's arts. changed. Yeah, yeah but, I think yeah. he's probably changed his, his opinion on I that think, a bit. A form of collusion to not yeah. talk about it. I think that's what he's saying as well about why the why culture has found it so hard mm. to engage. Like culture, um, artists, poets, the blah blah blah. They're all if a war starts, you know, it's like stop the war, peace, you know, stop the bombs over there, over there, other people throwing bombs. But this is we are complicit in this, so mm. that's why culture. Um, because um, culture has all, is still rarefied. Mm -hmm. You know, culture, of course there are people of working class backgrounds who've contributed to the arts, but culture is still owned by, you know, people with money and people with, um, you know, all the publishing houses mm -hmm. are Simon and & Schuster and, you know, Weidenfeld and & Nicholson and Faber and & Faber. These are old money, old white money, you know. Mm -hmm. So... Um, where do we go? Where am I going with this? <laughs> yeah, so culpability, it's like, yeah. it's all rolled into, it might be different if different people owned culture. Yeah. Do you feel a responsibility with your writing when you're deciding what to write next or, or what to engage with? Do you feel that, that as a heavy responsibility or do you feel it as just a part of your life as a writer and, and not a big um, deal? What, to... The pressure to, to talk about the climate crisis, to think um, about... I have written it. a climate novel, mm -hmm. a climate novel, which... Which uh, this is it. Well, so that's an interesting question because I wrote when my brother. So how I got, how I came to care about this and get myself two feet in and waist deep, is that fifteen years ago, and I can't believe it's that long ago. My brother um, lost his house in a flood, and um, he didn't lose it completely because they got it back, but it was really badly flooded um, over Christmas, and um, where you know the whole neighbourhood was flooded. Um, People were throwing their children over walls, you know, animals were swept away. There was devastation. It was completely devastated. Wow. He had to move. He couldn't yeah. live there. 
and and also once that happens to your neighbourhood, you can't sell your house because mm. your house becomes like on a floodplain. Um, so I've seen it firsthand, and, and my brother was really badly thrown by that, displaced. His kids had PTSD. Eventually, you know, he went into a kind of shock, and he it triggered an autoimmune um, illness in his hands. He got he got this plantar fasciitis, you know, his hands and feet. Um, have always since cracked and peeled because of the shock of it all. So one minute you've got a kind of functioning life, you know, you've got parents, a family, dogs, cats, two jobs, you're fully, the full, full functioning, yeah. you know, happy family. And the next minute it's all not flat in, in, in hours, you know, your whole thing. And, you know, it, it, I think he really suffered. And, and in those days, I was just kind of like, you know, ne'er do well, um, ducking and diving, kind of writer with no commitments, hasn't changed much, <laughs> and um, and um, and I just watched his world be not flat, and um, so I wrote a book in the aftermath about someone like him, and um, it won a prize, and it no one bought the book. I mean, it's, it's sort of sold, and so that's where I sort of thought, you know, books aren't going to necessarily um, change the world, you know. The Ministry of the Future has been read by many, and maybe even Barack Obama might read um, books like this, but no one's going to sort of like sit down around the cabinet table at, at 10 Downing Street and go, have you read Monique Roffey's book, <laughs> Archipelago, or have you read these books and we must do something now? They're not going to do that, are they? But what they are going to do is if they... So that's why activism has become something I'm much more committed to, mm. Because even though I haven't been arrested in the last five years, I see that as probably likely to change right. um, as we get more and more, um, as we face mm. a crisis, um, yeah. as it becomes so overt. Mm. And I think other people will feel like me as well. I don't think that getting arrested is going to seem like such an awful thing when your house is starting to get flooded, mm. you know, when it's your neighbourhood that gets hit, when it's your farming community, or when suddenly you feel that that flood's gone through your, your community. Then you'll think, you know what, fuck this, I'm going to go and I'm, I'm, I'm in, you know. And uh, we're not quite there yet. And I think this is the 70% of concern. And I just think we need a bad summer or a bad winter. And, you know, it's not going to be not far off. I would say it's Nature's that. PR team Sounds is working on well, it. Well, nature is working on <laughs> yeah. it, you know. Yeah. It's saying, wake up, because... Um, the systems in place are unsustainable. Yeah, totally. And I think that's interesting as well that you've chosen to band together with other writers as well, because we talked a little bit about, um, and he talks about in the book, this idea of um, the modern novel being very individualistic and, yeah, yeah. The, and cr a lot of criticism received by mm. books like Cities of Salt because it didn't follow one hero that mm. went on a journey and then it ended and mm. it, well, everything was fine at the end. Um, and this idea of like actually collective might be the only way to go for collective one thinking. book isn't going to change things I, so it's interesting because I, I have met Roger Hallam do you know, know who Roger Hallam is? ok so he founded Extinction Rebellion along with a bunch of others as well as Just Stop Oil and Insulate Britain and all these other radical he's a, he's a complete radical anarchist and he's a good thing I think mm -hmm. um, we, we, we need someone like him around <clears throat> I met, I've met him a few times I met him quite recently we were talking about arrests, and I was like, oh, I haven't been arrested yet. And he said, stop thinking about you, about you getting arrested. He's like, think collectively. This is a collective project. And that really helped. Mm. I was like, because we don't think collectively. We, we we, some of us know our neighbours, but we don't necessarily make a, make a point of it. But um, and that's a pity, because we've lost that, haven't we? Where mm. you, know, you know people around you. And then, and then you know... Um, yeah, I think this whole part of the great derangement is is, is um, capitalistic individuality. You know, yeah, just looking after yourself, your family, yeah, maybe and a then couple of tallying months. up your work as to whether you've been arrested or not, and then worrying about it. It's yeah, I've been so of, concerned. Like, yeah, and recycling. But, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I think it's 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 interesting to think about when we when we're trying to solve a future problem with our current status <laughs> and trying to have to unpick our mind a little bit and being like actually. So that's why I think it's great that you know you're banding together with other writers and and kicking off a storm together because I think it's the question is like how many arrests have we had this year? Yeah. And I know that a lot of st stuff with Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion can also be picking people up from prison once they're released, making sure they they know who to call, yeah. like bringing them food. Have There's... you been watching what's been going on in the Hague? You know, in 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 the Netherlands. I haven't been watching loads of it. Please. Okay, yeah. so in the Netherlands, um, 
they will have, they've had thousands and thousands and thousands of people protesting um, outside The Hague, outside Parliament. And, it got, it, and for weeks, you know, for weeks and weeks, thousands of people getting arrested, getting um, cannoned with water. And eventually the police just said, God, you know, to the, to the government, you've got to negotiate with these people. And that's what Just Up All are trying to get those numbers. They've had hundreds of people out on the streets for like two weeks. Mm -hmm. And just recently the police have just said, you know, they marched. In the beginning, you know, you put on the orange jackets. Do you know who I'm talking about, these people with the orange jackets? Mm -hmm. And within 10 minutes, the police would be there, like get off the streets and people would be beeping. And, and they just marched today or yesterday for like 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. but nobody turned up to stop them. The police right. are done. Yeah. And that's kind of where you kind of want to get to people who are no longer trying to stop the message getting through. And I think there's this idea that, um, you know, these are not average people marching. Um, these are, you know, posh white people marching or people who've got or, or retired people marching or student, students marching. But actually, that's not true. These are electricians and bakers and plumbers and um, you know, vicars and all kinds of people marching, and they haven't got that that argument um, right at all. And and then this is the idea you're stopping normal, average, average people from from you know working. Mm. And I'm like, well, why do you think we're doing that? Yeah, because we want them to be able to work long term. So yeah, well. this is yeah, yeah yeah short term. Anyway, I'm sounding yeah. like a newscast for Just Up Oil. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we're in interesting times. Um, as, you, as we were saying earlier, there's been a pandemic, there's been two wars, there's climate change. And um, I, ha I had um, COVID. I was one of these people who didn't get COVID. Um, so I had like two years I didn't get it. And then I got it last summer on the day um, that we had 40 degrees heat in London. And I was like, this is dystopia. <laughs> Nature was, it heard you boasting about the fact that you hadn't had COVID. And we were like, oh wait, your time will come. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's tough. Um, I'd love to know a little bit about how your students have responded to reading about the climate. Is it weird to he see them kind of talking about the climate and thinking about it through the course? Was it called the Green... Your course is called we're, the Green... We're only just putting this together. We've oh, only right. been running our first workshops this summer. And, yeah, we've had some really interesting people come um, and some writing. Um, so we're piloting our first green writing elective on the MA uh, in January. Yeah. Uh, so I'll let you know about that. But I think, okay. it, you know, whereas five years ago you put in green writing, nothing would come up. And I think more and more, there's the Black Mountain College in Wales. Okay. Um, that started up, that's Owen Shears and uh, a few of his friends. Um and um, there's our green course. There'll be great. There's you know there's Schumacher College. There's yeah. all kinds of people who've been writing about environmentalism, and it's very English. <laughs> you think? think about it. It's an Do English tradition. The petrofiction um, thing huh? goes back. Pe petrofiction is that what they call it? They have like oil by Ian Sinclair and stuff. This idea of oh, them, a lot of like classic books secretly having oil in them. Not just oil, but you know, if you think about na love of nature, yeah, you know, poet poets and um, the romantic poets and John Clare and and I I think two things are very English: one, a love of nature, and two, organised resistance and rebellion. It's as English yeah. as you know. You're talking about everybody: the Chartists, the Suffragettes, the Dongas, the Levellers, the this, the that. You know. Yeah. Everybody, this is a country that has always, you know, we've chopped the head off our king, you know, we've rebelled and rebelled and rebelled, you know, we've been doing it for so long. And we still have a monarchy and, um, you know, still there and uh, give it lot. another, we'll see, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, so I think, you know, this idea of, of climate activism, I'm surprised that more people haven't been more active because it's mm. something that, so, for example, the National Trust, um, if you look on Twitter, does anyone here use social media and it's on Twitter and that kind of thing? So, <clears throat> again, the land in this country is owned, obviously, by wealthy people, aristocrats and, you know, farmers. With, farmers who have land are usually the tenants who will work, you know, somebody else yeah. owns the land and <coughs> freeholds. So you're talking about basically right wing, when the right wing environmentalists um, wake up to this, which they are waking up mm. to this, 
Um, I think the National Trust have said um, we're very, you know, we're dead against what Rishi Sunak's doing, you know, yeah. with reversing the green, um, blah, blah. And it's like when we get, I mean, this is the heart of, yeah. of, of what we're talking about is posh um, environmental lists who own land, who own all the bloody land, yeah. you know. And it's like, guys, you know, this is like, this is your call. When the National Trust are pissed, you know. It's when the bad, National Trust, great. and not just at the Royal Society for the yeah. Protection of Birds, you know, the bird watchers, mm -hmm. and all these people who love the countryside. They don't just love it, they own it, okay? Mm -hmm. They own the countryside. So we need to get them, that's the seventh, that's when, that's when the tip will go, and then all people in um, high up, you know, are going to go, shit, they're oh, right, yeah. you know. We need to really get behind it. And then crazy people stopping traffic, you know, they won't seem so crazy. Yeah, it's all you know, perspective. Isn't it's it? like, we're going to see so many changes. Yeah. I think for me, I always struggle to stay pissed off. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'll read something like this, and then I'm like, I've got to, you know, and then I've got to do some other things, and I forget. And I think life. books like this are really yeah. great, because they remind you, and you can highlight stuff and stick it around, and be like, no, I, I actually need to stay a little pissed <laughs> at all times. Yeah. And I think the Right to Remain campaign are, are talking about trying to get back some of the land in, the, in, in England, which I think yeah. will be really interesting, because yeah. I think once people realise... And realise how good Scotland have got it. At least they've got the right to roam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But um, but yeah, no, it's brilliant. But we've become so sort of like stable and well, we're. I mean, is it complicity or are we just like we know the rules? We all fall into our little place. We've all got, you know, we all we all know exactly where we are, who we are. It's fine. You know, it's all okay. We've just accepted it. We're a monarchy. Yeah, definitely. Um, I always ask at the end of these podcasts whether we would recommend this book to people. And I love to hear in the room, like, has anybody read this book? So it's necessarily that you haven't, but a few people are nodding. Yeah, a couple of people. Um, for those in the room who are thinking, oh, maybe this is the book I'll pick up about the climate, what would you say to them? Would you recommend this okay. to everybody? Or I would like, where say would it not be everybody. It's not a holiday read. It's not a light read. <laughs> um, it's not one of those books They don't books get married that, at the end. No. I think <laughs> if you like writing and want to write and are a writer... Yes, definitely. Um, if you want to know more about the climate change, yes, definitely. And if you're both, yes. But I don't think it's like for everybody. I think he's like obviously he's terribly clever. It's a very clever book. It's a, and he gets goes into you know capitalism and you know being that's the great derangement is you know that we've set up this system and are we mad? You know, are we deranged that we think that this is um. And he, he talks about um, this all coming from the West, but he's also very honest about Asia mm. and saying that even though Asia is um, a part of the world that's most likely to suffer from climate change, there was a massive boom in, in economy there. That's also, and he says something like, if everybody in Asia lived like we do, I had a fridge, two cars, um, blah, blah, all the things that we do, red meat, I mean, David Attenborough's about this. We can't all be eating red meat. Mm. Luckily, you know, large parts of the world don't eat red meat. But he's talking about... Um, so he gets into sort of the politics of it, history of it as well. If that's for you, then this is a great book. <laughs> <laughs> it really isn't. I think it's, it, it's a kind of great, especially if you are thinking about being a writer or writing or already write. I think yeah. it's a really important one to to start making yourself feel like you're part of a community of people who want to write about this. It's not <coughs> just you. And I think things have changed since you wrote this book, but they, they could, there could be more. There could be more people, people in Writers Rebel. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think yeah. it's, it's, if you're thinking about... Also if, I guess if there's anybody who works in publishing in the room as well, I think this is an interesting one to bring up in some meetings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and he's like, also wow. written The Nutmeg's Curse, which is mm, more about colonisation and how colonisation, you know, is part of the problem. You yeah. Know, he talks about... The north and the south, and you know, the usual stuff. But it's yeah. it's a it's a, it's an easier read. Yeah. Um, do we have Definitely. time for questions? Can, do we have a few? What what, what time? Are we? we do have five minutes for questions. So should we should we open it up a little bit? Does anybody have any questions about being arrested <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> being pissed off or anybody who read the book and had different thoughts to us and thought it was rubbish? <laughs> That's also allowed. It is a book club. Yeah, over here. I guess like what advice would you when you open up your MA course are you going to sort of give to students or what conversations will you have with students about bridging the gap between sort of writing 
books that people can still read to sort of escape reality because I feel like with climate literature sometimes it's like I want to read a book where I can relax and sort of turn off and not be sort of scared before I go to bed when I'm doing my nighttime reading mm. about what the next 20, 30 years are looking like. How, how do writers bridge that gap between not ostracizing people by sort of presenting them with the facts that things are going to change really rapidly but still kind of writing enjoyable literature? That's a really good question, and it's not just the problem with writing books, it's the problem we have generally with this problem, because it is it is what you use the word ostracising. How many people here, when someone like me, you meet someone like me maybe in the pub, and you think, I mean, you basically just don't want to come anywhere near me, do you? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly the problem, because... How many of you would like to be more active? How many people can... Who, who here is the 70% concerned? Yeah. But, so, what's, what's the ostracisation factor? What is it um, between being concerned and being basically quite active and well-informed and, you know, being prepared to march? Mm. What's the difference? I mean, is it time? You're too busy? I, I mean, it's like Nina said, staying pissed off, like I just chill and go. It's like the thing. numbness that yeah. comes in. So yeah. yeah. You busy. Live life and then you realise you haven't done enough for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I, for me as well, I think it's also about working out what's most effective because I think uh, Rob, um, Roger Hallam's writing on being arrested was really interesting to read about because I didn't know a lot about the research around why arrest is kind of effective. <laughs> and I think that's something that, that's interesting as well, like trying to work out how effective you can be wherever you are. But I don't know if it, yeah. I feel like um, for me, I marched a lot um, when I was young with my family. And I feel like it didn't do a lot. <laughs> you did and I do feel a lot. just kind of despondent now and pretty depressed. And even just walking here, I've just moved over from Australia and walking through Oxford Circus to here, I was just like, well, what's the bloody point? <laughs> Why am I going to do I hear that. climate change? Um, yeah. I mean, for four years I've been um, working with a group and uh, marching and, you know, doing everything I can, really. And then when Rishi Sunak announced this, what was it, a month ago or something, I mean, I've never been more depressed. I mean, it was just astonishing that he's done this. But, so... We marched in uh, April. In Extinction Rebellion called it the big one. I think there must have been about, I don't know, 40,000 people or something. Mm. Um, maybe the size of the marches you're seeing now for Palestine. Maybe half the size, actually. Because okay. I've been looking at those marches and I was thinking people are more upset about this war than they are about the climate. Because they've been out for week, four Saturdays and those are big marches. So they're about, what, 80,000? No, 300,000. Yeah, it's 300,000. Okay, 100. so for the climate, we probably not even 100,000. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're up against. It's like, um, we aren't, yeah, people aren't, if, if, if half a million people turned up week after week after week, things would change. Yeah. I think it's hard to like, I often remember all the things that haven't changed, but it's hard to remember all the things that have. And like, uh, when I was a teenager, imagining being able to watch my friends get married who were gay, like that mm. would not, that wasn't something I thought would ever be possible for them. Yeah. So then I go to like family members' weddings who are, who are getting married mm. and, and having same sex marriage, and that's something that I couldn't have imagined. I remember going into pubs and everyone smoking, <laughs> and now I'm like, oh wow. Oh, yeah. Apparently, people just smoke on the tube, which yeah. is very exciting to me for some reason. People I was like, just wow. smoke on planes. <laughs> But on planes, on planes yeah, the but. scandal. I mean, that's a very small thing, but in some ways, it is a big thing as well. I think there's lots of things that have changed, and it's almost like I maybe should start mm. keeping like a change journal <laughs> or something where it's like, here are some things that you didn't think would change in your yeah. lifetime and already have. Okay, so but it's hard because so there I, is lots of really just depressing. Yeah, there's elect. Outcomes. So we all have a vote. So we elect leaders, right? So there's that kind of power. Parent, there's that power. You know, you get to vote, and we all know there's an aging demographic and. And like Brexit, possibly that, you know, people over a certain age brought Brexit in marginally. But um, where am I going with this? Where am I going with this? Hope. 
Give us hope. <laughs> Things change. Tell us about, Tell us about okay, the oil thing is about here's our elected leaders, okay, and here is corporate money. So there's two types of power. There and these leaders that we elect, okay, they're all invested. Okay, literally, they all have portfolios. Okay, so our elected leaders are invested. Our banks are invested. So how do we persuade this divestment? Okay, it's got to happen, but it can't happen if this so. So we have to start really thinking cleverly about who we elect, who we bank with, where we put our money, because money is power. We all have a bank account, you know, of some sort. We may only have... You know, I don't know how much the average savings in this country is something like seven hundred pounds. You know, it's not good, but I think that um, it's the invisible power that we're dealing with. We're not really the average MP. You know, yeah, the average MP isn't the problem. Yeah, it's it's look how rich rich is. Where things is look set up. I, I've been really interested, like watching what Client Earth do, and they're basically a group of lawyers that are just like, we're just going to sue everyone. Like our client is Earth. There are laws. We're just going to sue everyone, and that's what the UN is working on at the moment with Palestine as well, is looking at what what is illegal about the things that what the people that have already fought for laws to be changed, and people just aren't following them. Mm. I think that's a really interesting space. Is is there what was, so just doing. to end this, a woman called Trudy yeah. Warner. I don't know if you're aware of her. She's she's um, maybe in her seventies, and she was arrested because she stood outside a court and she just had a law on her thing which said, as a juror, you have a right to act according to your conscience. Like, you, you, that's the law. So somebody could be guilty of something, but actually not. And it's your conscience that's part of your legal right. And she just had this and they've arrested her and she could face up to three or four years in jail for simply saying the right thing you know so we're in tough times here mm -hmm. and so you know I agree with you at the back that you know I've done I agree with you but again if when I look at those marches and there are 300,000 people they've turned up <coughs> time after time all month and it may go on till Christmas it may go on till this all stops we need that those kind of numbers on the streets for the climate yeah do you think maybe the issue then kind of specificity like Climate is such a big Possibly. thing, whereas Palestine, Israel, people can get behind because it's a war that's happening now. Whereas climate is yeah. so big, it's happening like, everywhere. I don't know if it's going yeah. to show up. <laughs> It's it's yeah, omnipresent. Definitely. It's to it's the story poly. aspect, isn't it? Yeah. This is, this is a, it's a, a simpler story that's happening in a smaller space of time. Yeah, and, and it's all, really really important. Yeah, but um, yeah, but yeah, something like that. Well, yeah. stories, and, and we do need. Yeah, I mean, there's something called the. Um, the Children's School Climate Action Network or something, the school scan or something. We need kids, we need kids, um, we need the new generation, we need Greta, we need Fridays for Future, we need children on board, we need young people on board, we need, you know, I think that's what we, politicians call, you know, they see a sort of 15 year old with a placard, you know, what they're going to say. Mm. Um, so it's, it's I, th I hate to say it, I mean, it sounds very doom scrolling and doomy, but we're, we're in a place where it's about to change and then the 70% will be marching. Yeah. And, you know, if, 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 if things get so bad that it feels like you're in a, um, a war or something very, very big's happened, then those numbers are going are gonna, to are gonna happen, I think. Yeah, I think a lot of us will feel quite alone now, but in five years, I don't think it'll be... Yeah, it won't, won't be, it you'll won't be, be like looking your... Do you remember the <laughs> war? Do you remember when, when they took us into war with Iraq? There was a big march. Did anyone go to that march? Yeah, a million people marched, yeah. and they still they still did it. They still they still yeah. yeah. But I think if 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 I think that's the kind of turn up we need. When you say what can we do, you could do that. Mm. You know, that's what we can do. Yeah, it's a, it's a display against apathy, isn't it? As well, even if they don't change it, I want the history books to show that we didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, we weren't on board. We were pissed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for reading Pleasure. this book for this many. So there you have it. There's another 
episode of No Books on a Dead Planet over. But don't worry, there are loads more waiting for you on your feed on literally any podcast platform now. I think I've covered them all. Thank you so much for listening. And of course, if you'd like to support the production of this podcast, you can join the Gumption Club, which is the Patreon group that makes this possible. All the links will be in the show notes. And of course, I encourage you to follow Monique Roffey and the Writers Rebel, who also have an incredible database of climate reads called the Rebel Library that I actually recently wrote an article for. So again, it's all in the show. If you want it, it's in the show notes. It's always going to be in those show notes. Thanks for listening. Over and out.